our next panel is U.S. Institutional Investor Outlook. This panel is chaired by Herman Larratt, the Director of Global Macro, CTA, and Multi-Strategy at Titan Advisors. He's joined on stage by Charles Van Vliet, the Assistant Treasurer and CIO of Textron Pension Plan, Timothy Barrett, Associate Vice Chancellor and CIO of the Texas Tech University System, Paul Colonna, President and CIO of Lockheed Martin Investment Management Company, and Jeffrey Rubin, Senior Managing Director and Chief Investment Strategist at CPPIB. Take it away. Thank you. Um, so uh, welcome everyone and uh, obviously we're, hi Jeff, <laughs> good timing. <laughs> um, so maybe, maybe we could just start by having each of the panelists uh, just introduce themselves very briefly um, and also just give us a, a, a quick idea of what you focus on mostly uh, with respect to um, asset class or portfolio construction aspect of the portfolio, if you will. I'm uh, the CIO at Textron. Textron's an industrial manufacturing firm in Providence, Rhode Island. Make uh, Cessna airplanes, spell helicopters, easy go golf carts. You have them in one of our products. And uh, I am the CIO overseeing $12 billion worth of defined contribution, defined benefit assets uh, globally, UK, US, and Canada. I'm Tim Barrett. I'm the CIO at Texas Tech University. We produce uh, future leaders. Uh, no helicopters. <laughs> um, I manage about two billion in assets, about 1.2 billion in an endowment structure, and the other 800 million uh, is tier three operating capital, which is just capital you don't need for the next five years. Okay. And I'm uh, Paul Colonna. I'm uh, president and chief investment officer for Lockheed Martin, also an industrial company. In the uh, in the defense and aerospace industry, uh, we run 80 billion in assets uh, from the uh, defined benefit and defined contribution plans for the company. Great, and it's Jeffrey Rubin. I'm the chief investment strategist with the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board. We invest the assets of the Canada Pension Plan, which now amounts to about 400 billion dollars Canadian, on behalf of all Canadian workers and retirees. Great, thank you very much. So if I, I'd just like to start by, by framing the backdrop and just start by saying that, you know, the, this is a very, entire, a very, very tough environment to navigate. Um, and, you know, when we think about how well fixed income has performed and how well equities have performed uh, and arguably um, not going to perform as well going forward, maybe I can start with you, Charles, in terms of thinking about valuations and thinking about uh, growth, thinking about uh, demographics and things of that nature, and even throwing ESG since we just talked about it, how are, you, how are you changing your investment process to deal with all these issues, including you know, the random tweets and things of that nature? <laughs> Well, you, you heard from the experts this morning, certainly much smarter than I am, that timing of an economic cycle is a near impossibility. So the best I can do, I think, as, as this gets longer in the tooth, is look for investments, which I would call an asymmetrical profile, has better downside capture than upside capture. So I have been over the last two or three years now, arguably early, because it, it continues to be a robust market and economy, but well, trading units of S&P for units of convertible bonds, units of S&P for SPACs, units of S&P for units of consumer staple stocks, uh, units of S&P for private credit. These are things, again, that I feel will have a, an asymmetrical capture. I'm still going to positive carry. Um, I, an asymmetrical capture, better downside than upside. Uh, my favorite tail risk uh, strategy right now is we're just, we're kind of perpetually long dollar euro calls and dollar versus Aussie calls. Uh, that's a positive carry. It's a good tail strategy. It costs me Virtual, well, it costs me nothing because it's positive carry, and I do it in the, in the forwards market. Um, my favorite, I, I think as much as being prepared for that event, another, it's also important to be ready for the opportunities that will arise in the next event. I simply can't move the committee fast enough for, uh, to, to populate a new product. So, for example, we have put a nickel into public BDCs. Because I know in the next event, BDCs, as you know, commonly can trade at 10, 20 point discounts. Retail indiscriminately sells. So I put in a nickel now so I can push in a dollar later. If I don't have it ready, I'm just not going to be able to move fast enough. So we have seed capital with a nickel, ready to push in a dollar, and public BDCs. Uh, we have pushed the same thing with a nickel now for a dollar later into a strategy which is focused on fallen angels. There's this cliff of triple Bs. 
There's a lot of people who will indiscriminately sell because they haven't managed their cure language, particularly in the corporate space. Uh, so I've, we've seen capital a, a strategy that will focus just on fallen angel. And it, so again, I think we need to we need to look for things where you you can move quickly. Uh, secondary CLOs. We, again, we have a a secondary risk retention and CLO equity. Terrific space. It will trade a significant discounts. I need to be quickly able to, to move my capital there. So Tim, maybe moving on to you. We chatted uh, pre you know, beforehand, and you mentioned a number of managers that you you'd allocated to, and it sounds like you've allocated a fair amount of your capital to individual hedge fund managers. And I'm just curious when you, you know, when, when we think about negative rates and the inability of pension funds to meet some of their uh, liabilities, uh, has, that, has that always been something that you guys have done or is, is it something that you shifted into over time given the lack of returns and given where spreads are and you know, triple Bs and you know, double Bs are trading at 389, right. for example? Um, it, it is has not been a recent shift that uh, we've been in credit probably at multiple firms I've been in credit for since 04 when we started building on alternative credit. I would say that the shift this past couple years has been more in line with trying to find things with shorter duration and collateral backed. Um, just try to get a little safer. Uh, another example of that would be uh, we like uh, the CLO type structure. Uh, and we have a separate account that's kind of empty with CLOs, same idea, waiting for the dislocation that never seems to come. Um, but we also put money into uh, a CLO structure that does infrastructure loans, which we like a lot because we think that's it's a lot uh, less volatile and has a lot less downside than traditional CLOs. Um, we're getting about the same return. Um, but our big push has been very similar. We're pushing a lot of money into what we call diversifying assets. So that's where we have like a, a trade finance platform we bought. Um, we're probably going to sell that this year. Um, we have vol managers, convert ARB, uh, all those type of things. And we've moved that from like 15% of the portfolio to 20% of the portfolio this year. Uh, just kind of in preparation of whenever that last inning is. Interesting. Um, and that's been a big push for us. Thank you. So, Paul, you've, you've seen everything. Mm -hmm. You've worked at Freddie Mac. You've been mm -hmm. on the GSE side. Mm -hmm. uh, you've seen the inner workings of uh, how... 90, as you put it earlier, 99 to 1 type <laughs> leverage. Um, obviously, what you do today is, is a little different. Um, but has monetary policy and QE and asset purchases created many bubbles uh, that could emulate into something comparable to a 2007, eight, uh, 2007 2008? And if, if that is your thought process, um, how, how are you structuring the portfolio to to, to, to create a safety net, yep. as it were. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I certainly don't think we're on the path to, to, to 2007, 2008. I could be wrong, but I think clearly when you look at asset valuations, especially in the fixed income markets, you could, you could argue for, for incredibly lofty valuations, you know, lower yields, and, uh, and you do wonder what is the, the true expected return out of those asset classes over the, over the you know, a time horizon that we look at over the next 5, 10 15 years. So, so for us, it, it does leave you in a space where, you know, if you're thinking strategically, I think you have to think about the portfolio and, 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 and stick to your, you know, your, your, your strategic insights uh, around, uh, around looking at the portfolio. And for us, you know, in a world where, you know, look, equities aren't exactly cheap. Uh, fixed income is very rich. It's been a great year, just very tactically speaking. It's been a great year for, for asset allocators uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of asset class performance. Uh, across the board, but I think for us, you know, I think you have to look at the the, the long term, um, um, you know, centers of uh, of gravity for your for your business. And for us, it's you know, we have to, you know, we pick managers mostly. That's what we do. And you have to pick great managers. You know, you know we talked, uh, you know, some of the panels earlier this morning about, um, you know, about uh, private equity and returns in private equity. You know, if you look at the quartile distributions uh, of of performance in private equity managers, they're tremendous. So finding top quartile managers in you know, private equity in hedge funds in active equities is really important. You know, we're looking to concentrate uh, our equity portfolios and, and and make sure that we have uh, you know the right managers in the right places. I think that that's very important. And hedge funds, you know, I think we're looking for you know true idiosyncratic type strategies mm -hmm. uh, for us that can generate returns. And so I, I think you you have to, you know, you know we're, we're not going to move a, an eighty billion dollar battleship you know around you know around a tactical situation. 
So for us, I think it's got to, you know, you've got to lean into those, those kind of core principles of, mm -hmm. of manager selection, concentration in active markets, you know, the beta in your portfolios, you've just got to try to get it cheaper or maybe even insource it, you know, yourselves, which I think you see a lot of plans doing. So just be efficient right. around beta, you know, beta management and, uh, uh, and then, and then, lastly, for us, since we're a corporate plan, it's you know, it's obviously managing you know the risk management of the of the liabilities around the uh, around the pension scheme. So those are the kind of things that that we, we've got to focus on, even in a world where you could argue that you know, look, you know, two percent rates are you know are, are not a place that you want to be investing long term in. Right. So you mentioned shifting an eighty billion dollar uh, balance sheet around. You know, when we think about Dodd Frank and Volcker and, and and the various regulations that have inhibited. Uh, the banks from from using their balance sheet, uh, or or reduced uh, the amount of balance sheet that they can uh, apply to you know running their business. Um, how do you think about liquidity risk, and how is that? How is that? How have you incorporated that 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 factor, if you will, into your risk framework? So 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 for us, and and I, and I may regret saying this, uh, but but I you know I you know liquidity is actually not something that that we're extremely worried about. I mean, that's yeah. just something yeah. when I, when I, I, my personal, you might opinion, regret that. I know exactly. <laughs> I, I, I said it and now it's out there, but I, but I do look at, it. I, I personally, I think, I think most corporate plans, um, you know, they, I mean, look right now we've got, I think it's like 60% of our assets are tradable within a day. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, mm. you know, it, it's actually something where I think you want to be a little more thoughtful, uh, around how you, you know, how you look at asset classes, especially when, and, you know, to take it back to the public fixed income markets, you know, where we, uh, where we started the question, those are some of the richest asset classes on the planet right now. They're liquid, but you know, at what point can you, you know, can you really deploy, you know, a lot of capital at right. at two percent return? So, I, so I actually think that, you know, of all the things that I'm I'm worried about and I'm thinking about, liquidity is is not at the top of that list. And and for us, you know, we've got a manageable process where we, you know, look, we have to make benefit payments, we have to do things yeah. over time, but it's not a day to day liquidity, you know, moment yeah. for us. So. Yeah, for us, I mean, I just interject there. For us, it's a, it's a huge part of what yep. we what yep. we think about. Obviously, yep. when we allocate to to hedge funds, crowding is a is a is a huge issue, yep. and obviously, AUM is to the detriment of returns. Um, so, shifting to to you, Jeff, um, and by the way, we should rename this from the U.S. institutional investor <laughs> uh, outlook to North American institutional <laughs> uh, investor outlook, since Jeffrey works for CPPIB. <laughs> Um, so as the non-U.S. investor here, um, you know, we hear in, in manager meetings guys selling frackers to buy renewables and, 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 and things of that nature. And then there, there are pundits on the tape talking about how equities are going to drop 25 percent if Warren wins the nomination. So as an outsider, um, how, how do you view the political landscape and how are you taking precautions for an eventual um, Elizabeth Warren victory and, and what do you think the odds of that are? Yeah, well, gratefully, we view that from afar. That's the, <laughs> that, that's the good news. Uh, look, this is the, the relentless optimism we heard this morning from the, some of the initial speakers makes an impression on us. And it, uh, it's something we need to contend with, but we want to contend with it over the appropriate horizon, over the, the mm -hmm. over length of time that's, that's suited to our particular circumstance and our our mission and the, the liability structure and the cash flows that we have, all of which are intentionally designed to be very long term. Uh, the situation is going to unfold here as it also unfolds around the globe. And we are very decidedly diversifying across these geographies, very decidedly diversifying across asset classes and sectors in a way that, uh, that, that we really hope one particular event and one particular country is not going to unduly impact our overall portfolio construct and design. It's that relentless pursuit of diversification that I think uh, for us is, is consistent with the kind of profile we have as a fund and the kind of horizon we have as a fund. I'd love to also just quickly chime in on the, on the liquidity yeah. challenge because mm -hmm. you know, our types of institutions, for exactly the reasons you described, Paul, uh, we should be, we should be yeah tremendously well positioned to monetize our liquidity position with predictable inflows and outflow constructs and, and, and protection from the kinds of runs or the kinds of redemptions that, that many other asset managers face. It is a darn challenge, though, to monetize that, that, that special liquidity position in the kinds of markets that we face now. There's a real concern 
that the illiquidity premium is, is positive over time. It's super positive one year out of 10, and it's roughly zero nine years out of 10. And deploying that illiquidity in periods where there is not compensation for that illiquidity premium is really difficult and frustrating and challenging. And I hear all of the different strategies that, that, that these folks have talked about as, to my mind, some means of being able to monetize that, that inherent liquidity position that, that we do enjoy. So that's an interesting point. So for example, I was talking to a mortgage salesperson last week and they were bringing a deal to market and the double B you know, was price talk was 700 in CLO and it widened out to 800. So presumably you guys are loving that. Um, so along those lines, uh, when we think about levered loans and, and widening in spreads in here currently, um, student loans is a market that's ballooned over, over the last several years. Uh, think about ETFs and thinking about private credit funds and that mismatch between uh, the underlying securities and the liquidity of the instruments themselves. Charles, how, how, how do you think about that in, when, when you think about those products? And what, what, what do you think is the next canary in the coal mine, if, if at all? Well, we know the next crisis will look nothing like the last, and that's kind of the nature of it. But we were talking specifically in our, in our pre-calls about fixed income, illiquidity crisis. It just drives me nuts every time I read something about ETFs. A, a fixed income ETF, by design, it's impossible to have liquidity run. You know, the, the, the AP will, re, will create a redeem on a stratified basket of one bond. Yeah. Of course, they're, they're dumping illiquidity on the, on the, on the remainers in the mm -hmm. fund. Yep. But, and people will not necessarily get market when they sell. They might only get 90 cents on the dollar. But it's really a tremendously better vehicle over a mutual fund vehicle. And private credit, same thing. It's in, I know what liquidity is on my private, my private credit. It's zero. And that's good. That's fabulous. Everybody's, everybody's handcuffed in together in this structure. So I actually don't see it private, uh, I don't see fixed income illiquidity being, being the canary. Okay. Tim? Um, I, I think there is illiquidity problems, especially if you get to emerging market debt and you start looking at the gap risk in emerging markets. You can actually push, push the trade around quite a bit in emerging markets. Um, and you know, stuff that I would argue from our managers say that, you know, stuff that used to trade at 40s will now drop all the way to the 20s now, right? Um, and there's just no buyers on that end. You got to really be a lot more patient and EM because of that lack of liquidity. I would also say that in our portfolio, um, liquidity is a much bigger issue than what it is for these guys. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, we don't have a, uh, a machine pumping money into us every day. Ours is outflow mostly. Um, so we have to manage that liquidity to be able to take advantage of the dislocations in the markets. That is true, and because I, I, yeah, as a pension, I have r really near perfect foresight to my outflows. I mean, short of a bubonic plague, I know exactly what my cash flows are for the next thirty years. Right, and it is very different for you. Yeah. So, Tim, do you like century bonds in Argentina? <laughs> I, I love Argentina, actually. Uh, they're, they're, they're the gift that keeps on giving, as one okay. of my managers, uh, Robert Kronzberger, always tells me. Um, yeah, we're deep in. Venezuela, Argentina, all those uh, emerging markets, they're in trouble. Paul and Jeff, any canaries in the coal mine? You guys like Argentina as well? <laughs> we're, we're not large in emerging fixed income, so no. right. I'm impressed. The long government bonds. Yeah. It's be, you'll, you'll <laughs> yeah, we're, we are very enthusiastic around emerging markets as a source of productivity and growth, broadly speaking over the, again, longer horizons. Uh, we, we tend to focus, about 20% of our portfolio now is in emerging markets and tends to be focused in geographies where we can build real scale. So questions around some of the, the smaller frontier markets that could be really interesting for other types of institutions, perhaps a little bit less so for us, the focus on China and India and Brazil and a few other LATAM focused countries is driven as much by our ability to, to get access to scale there as, as any particular thesis on the country. So I figured having four, four pension experts on, uh, on the panel here today, uh, I'd love to get some, uh, some insight into uh, your thoughts on uh, you know, pension risk transfer. And uh, you know, I, I read a lot about pension risk transfer to insurance companies and things of that nature. Is that, is that on the back of um, sort of underfunded pension funds and some of the inherent issues? And is, is that a looming problem? If there is a large downturn in the equity market, which has obviously been 
it, 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 large driver of returns for pension funds. You want, you want, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. start the conversation because yeah. we've done right. a few of those uh, transactions okay. at uh, Lockheed. We did two uh, at the uh, at the end of 2018. I, you know, when I think about risk management around a pension fund, I think it's I think it's just a part of the of the overall um, process of, of of risk management. You know, the first part of the process is you know you close the plan to new entrants, then you ultimately freeze the plan you know to new end uh, to uh, to everybody, and so you end the accretion of of benefits, and so then you understand what your liabilities are. So that's kind of step one. In the, in the at least the U.S. corporate pension uh, management process, step two is you know you look at ways how do you you know how do you manage the balance you know for the you know for the firm and 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 look we live in a world where you know you don't want to be talking about your pension fund on the earnings call the quarterly earnings call it's not what you want to be talking about you want to be talking about the business how you're investing in the business what the growth capabilities are you know where the the, the core business is heading and so pension risk transfers are a you know are a mechanism to help you with that and just you know, if you if you dive into that market a little bit on the on the pension risk transfer side, a lot of that I'll call it arbitrage. You know, for doing those transactions, quite frankly, is wrapped up in the PBGC fees that you have to pay as an organization, which quite frankly are um, exorbitant. You know, for uh, you know you know for companies to pay, and so I think pension risk transfers allows you to take down that that fee structure that the company has to pay. It also allows you to give visibility around your willingness to manage the overall balance of the pension, uh, and so there's there's some there's some benefits. Uh, you know, for you, uh, you, know, you know, in terms of that, it's not going to be the final solution. You know, it's not going to be something that you can just you know make your pension go away through pension risk transfers because they get very expensive as you as you as the yeah. fee arbitrage kind of reduces itself over time. So then that gets to the third part of the of the of the of the risk management process, which is really around what's your asset allocation strategy? What are you thinking about within the portfolio? How do you reduce funding status volatility? How do you still earn the returns that you need to earn? And that's really you know that that that's a lot of what a you know a pension fund CIO is 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 working on at that latter stage, but it's a it's a part of a holistic risk management process for for, for the pension PRTs being being a component of it. So all Paul's comments, I think, are ter that is the environment for corporate pensions these days. But I'll just just one caveat: it just drives me nuts when I see <laughs> a CFO go out. Remember, my, my unfunded pension we're ninety four percent funded, so I have six percent of a contingent claim. It's a contingent claim. I see too many CFOs, in my opinion, who go out there and then they'll issue a bond. So they will harden that claim and then top up their pension. So I've taken a contingent claim and substituted it with a hardened 20-year or 30-year bond. That's just nuts. As a shareholder, and I'm a share, everyone in this room is a shareholder in your personal account, it drives me crazy to see a CFO go out and borrow perfectly good capital instead of putting it to work in their, in their operating business, their operating efficiency, go buy something, build something, invent something. They bury it in, to offset a contingent claim. It drives me nuts. You must just believe in your ability to grow that. <laughs> but, it, it, well, you know, that's, that's my job. Go out go and, go and grow it. So, so, so Jeffrey, um, Paul mentioned private equity. Um, when, when you think about the Stop Wall Street Looting Act, um, is that going to alter your view uh, in terms of the potential returns in the sector if that's something that you, you guys are heavily involved in? Yeah, so we are. I think about a, about a quarter of our portfolio right now, so about $100 billion is, is in private equity, and we have significantly more in, in other private asset classes, including real assets and, and credit. And in all of those cases, we are evaluating the entire economic prospect and proposition of the investment. And that, that includes the return expectations, includes the, the premia, the, the, the risk premia they afford. It includes the entirety of the risk profile, including liquidity risk, including regulatory risk, if that's something that needs to, to be assessed and, and is on the horizon. Uh, as, as part of our overall portfolio construct, we obviously believe deeply in that asset class, managed both internally and with external partners. So it is it is something that has, has been and proven to have been a, a really important part of our overall portfolio design and, and, and risk-adjusted return performance. We'd expect it to continue to be so going forward. So I, I, we, don't, we don't see anything in particular that would, would undermine it. But to the extent issues arise, we, we certainly need to be eyes wide open as to how that risk return proposition is changing relative to everything else we have access to. So just turning for a second to monetary policy, 
um, and, and negative interest rates and, and things of that nature. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts and whoever wants to start, uh, you know, start off, take the lead. Um, but when we think about the reversal interest rate, what are your thoughts on that? And in the U.S. specifically, can you put a number on that? I do not have a number on that, but if it, uh, I mean, honestly, if we, if we reverse, I mean, just where equities are valued now based on the low rates and you just do the dividend discount model and you start getting rates go up, that probably does not bode super well for risk assets, right? If you truly are going to shift that way. Um, I think the market's a little split right now. I could probably pull half this room and they'd say we're going into Japanification and the other half would say, oh, we'll turn because physical stimulus will start moving uh, the curve. Um, I think we could easily be talking about this four years from now and, and saying what's going to happen to rates. Well, Ray said it well this morning. He said there's, there's only, over throughout history, there's only one true way that we've, we've reversed deflation. The natural state of capitalism, after all, is falling prices because capitalism is defined as producing ever more goods at ever falling prices, ever better productivity. So the natural state of, of capitalism is falling prices interrupted by these things. Those things are called wars. And that's what Ray said this morning. There's many types of wars. There's wars with, with guns and bullets. There's wars with capital. There's wars with words. There's wars with trade. And any one of those wars is an impetus to inflation. And what we need is, I'm sorry, a healthy dose of inflation. These pension obligations go away with inflation. Student debt goes away with inflation. Uh, you know, uh, government debt gets forgiven with, in, well, it goes away with inflation. It's that secret tax. We're, we're on our way to... We're desperately seeking inflation, and we'll find it. We have, we have the perfect leader for it. Yeah. I, I, I feel I mean, like you guys are talking your own book yeah. now. <laughs> inflation is great for my fund of status, yes. Yeah, I think a slight counter to that would be it depends what kind of inflation and, and whether it's anchored or unanchored, whether there's an expectation around that higher level of inflation or whether it's a big surprise. We uh, were talking with a, a central bank recently, and we talked about concerns around inflation getting unanchored, and they said they totally agree to the downside, which really surprised us. They, are, they were just as concerned, if not more so, about inflation getting unanchored low yes. as yep. it is to the high side, whether that suggests and or implies there's going to be continued monetary and, and combined with fiscal stimulus to, to ward against that, we'll, we'll see. But I think it's the inflation, yes, if, if in a well-anchored and, and, and predicted fashion. So it looks it's like we've got about a, five minutes before. Sorry, sorry. Can I, was, I was just going to say it's going to create a, a huge problem when you think about the pension underfunding that people were talking about earlier. Insurance. If you just take a 60-40 portfolio and yep. use the current building blocks with inflation where it is in rates, you get to about a 3%, 4% go for yep. return. It's not attractive. And yep. nobody can fund their liabilities with that, which I think is pushing everybody constantly over, over to the edges. Um, that's where you're going to see people get so, hurt, so, where they start stretching too far. So heading over the edge there, then we think about defined benefit plans. Should alternatives, um, what, what, what are your thoughts on alternatives? And, and what, is, oh. what is the industry doing to try and get that going? Well, if that is, of, if that is of, a yeah. source of yeah, yeah, One of the topics that we talked about was, you know, uh, right, we all took Econ 101, S must go to I, savings must go to investing. There's just many channels for that to happen. It can happen through an insurance channel, a pension channel, an ETF channel, you know, and, but the channel du jour that's happening from savings to investing, and money must move, it will move, or otherwise capitalism is dead. It's moving through personal directed, so individual directed accounts, whether it's 403B, 401K, and, and none of those are participating in a full balanced uh, amount of alternatives, particularly private equity and hedge funds. Real estate's starting to catch on a bit. So the, I'm active in a lot of organizations are how do we get personal directed assets, 403 BKs, IRAs, to participate more in private equity? And it is it's tough for one of the reasons mentioned in an earlier panel, because PE is losing the public relations campaign. You know, it will live as Warren and in the country at large is painting it as, well, they just steal the balance sheet and fire the workers. So it is, uh, it's a tough slug to paint a better picture to get private equity into these self-directed accounts. Paul, any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I think the industry is, is changing dramatically. We talked about, you know, we're trying to make the pension balances smaller. And quite frankly, we're trying to make the, the defined contribution balances larger. I mean, quite frankly, as a, you know, as a company, I mean, it's a, it, is, it will be the way the next generation accumulates wealth 
here in the United States. And, you know, as, as Charles pointed out, it's self-directed too, which, which adds some complexities. But I think the, the history of the industry also adds some, some complexity too. I mean, the, 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 the defined contribution plan was always a little bit of a, an add-on or a sidecar to the DB plan. It's like, well, you got a DB plan. We'll set up a DC plan with a couple of stock and bond funds and index funds, and you'll be fine because you got a DB. Right. Now we've taken away the defined benefit plans. And so I just, I think we all need to, and I know this is something we're looking at at Lockheed. I think we just all need to just think about what do we want out of these DC plans? How do we make them as, as appropriate and optimized as possible for the outcomes that I think the participants are going to want going forward? And, you know, if, again, if, if, if history is a guide and certainly, I, you know, our investment expertise is a guide, I think alternatives should play a piece in that outcome. I mean, that's why we do it in the defined benefit plan. If you're looking at at outcomes over the, the lifetime of a career and even post-retirement, uh, which I think people should be doing in terms of their, their defined contribution plans. Don't take your money out of your defined contribution plan at, at, at retirement. Keep it in. It's low fees. It's good management for, uh, for, for people. But you know, thinking through retirement on these plans, I think you're going to need alternatives. And I think as an industry, um, you know, as Charles was mentioning, I think as an industry, I think there's, there's, there's space for us to, to think about how we, get those, how we get those outcomes in. How do we get private equity in? How do we get hedge funds in? Um, how do we stop kind of the frivolous litigation that's going to occur? Because this is, at the end of the day, the impact is going to be felt on the individuals. And we talk about a lot of crises up here this morning. I mean, certainly the other crises out there is the retirement crisis. And it's a big one, and it's real. And I think we're going to need to find a way as an industry, especially within the alternatives industry, to get that type of product and those type of returns and those types of you know, great ideas into a defined contribution platform over time. Great. Uh, Jeffrey, maybe start with you and, and, and work towards Charles. Uh, we've got about, actually, almost running out of time. I'd love to leave some time for questions. Um, so I know when Madison Square Gardens is full for the Knicks game, that means the economy is doing very well, because otherwise no one would ever go to see them. Um, do we, what, what is your individual um, favorite economic indicator for, for the pulse of the economy? Just very quickly. Start with you, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, I was. You, you talk about the Knicks. I was going to say something about the Raptors and the World Championship <laughs> that we hold, but uh, you know the Canadian economy hasn't done terribly well since uh, since that cropped up. Uh, a pulse check on the economy. Uh, you know what? Let me go last. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> okay, Paul. So my, my, my favorite would be it used to be taxi drivers. Now it's Uber, Lyft drivers. Uber. Just whenever you're in a city, and I, okay. and I and I travel, you know, not extensively, but a bunch, and yep. I think always getting a little check from them on how things are going locally, especially when you get out of the you know New yep. York, San Francisco, sure. you know, type areas, L.A. areas. Uh, it's yeah. it's 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 fascinating what you may hear. Yep, I love that one, Sam. Mine's uh, boring. It's uh, more like PMI and service indicators. Okay. To see how they, to see how so doing. you're excited about this morning's services number <laughs> coming in at 54.7. That's got to be I, good. I, I get excited about things like that, yes. Any challenge? And uh, equally boring, mine's the, the, the jolts, you know, voluntary departures. Mm -hmm. It says everything about uh, wage yeah. inflation. Nobody leaves their job unless they're le leaving it for better money. Yeah. You don't have to. Upon, upon reflection, I would <laughs> maybe it's the number of times my board asks whether or not we are ready to de-risk the portfolio. Oh. Counter yeah, really. okay. that's, a, that's a good one. <laughs> so now, just uh, last question, uh, very sure. quickly, thinking good. ahead to 2020, uh, where are you guys shifting your capital? A lot of LPs in the room really want to know that, obviously. Um, and what do you think is going to be the best performing asset class in 2020? Obviously, that's the same sort of question. But. Uh, where we're shifting, um, I would say when 2020 comes around, uh, our view is that equities are probably going to take off again and we'll be shifting a little bit more into equities. Uh, we're also maintaining uh, a lot of those empty accounts for the crisis at the same time and also mm -hmm. tail hedging that increase in equities. Uh, so we're not going into equities with that much confidence just because of valuations, mm -hmm. uh, but we feel like there's not a lot of other places to go right now. So we'll be there on a hedge basis. Okay, Paul. Uh, yeah, we, we, you know, tactically, we, we, we like the equity markets here as well. I think there's a pretty, there's a pretty straight, you know, straight market higher, you know, between here and certainly call it Super Tuesday or whatever, you know, however you want to sketch mm -hmm. out the early part of next year, and then it, and then may get a little more interesting. So, so we like we we like the risk markets and alternatives. You know, I, you know we're we're trying to figure out how do we how do we thoughtfully de-risk our pension plan and 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 do that in a way that that that. Uh, 
know, that incorporates alternatives, private credit. So we'll be allocating uh, you know, probably more to privates going forward on a thoughtful basis, avoiding, again, some of the rich liquid sectors uh, right. you know, that, uh, that we've previously discussed. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, emerging market, local currency, fixed income is one area we're particularly focused on, both for the returns and the diversification value. Wow. Wow. It brings to the portfolio. Interesting. Charles? So we've built up a, uh, a position the last two or three years with, with a couple of strategies public in the public equity space that uh, we, my team has, when I call it, I call it my cat's portfolio. It's focused on consumer staples, chocolate, alcohol, yeah. tobacco. They are three government sanctioned drugs. People will pay any price for them. I consume all three. I will pay any price for all of them. They will, they will have, again, that better capture ratio. They will capture less of a downside, better of the upside. They'll do well if an inflation scenario comes along. People, these are inelastic demand curves. So. Uh, I, I don't know when or if this thing's going to happen. I just I just want to capture less of the downside and still maintain upside exposure. Interesting, given the fact that the, the trade for inflation is the least positioned for trade out there. You know, public equities do fine inflation up to 5%. I mean, Goldman's trafficked that research yeah. for years. And so, uh, you know, consumer staples, my Altria, my Imbev, my... My, you know, these, you know, these, my Hershey's chocolate, we heard about that earlier today. Um, <laughs> these, these are things which I think will have some sustainability over, right. over turmoil. Right. Well, well thank you. Uh, let's open the floor up for, for a couple of very quick questions. Uh, we have just on, under a minute left. Um, this gentleman right there. Should we that? Sure. The question is, uh, Charles mentioned 6% underfunded. This gentleman would like to hear what the, what the balance of the, the panelists uh, have in that regard. Tim? We're in endowments. So. Yeah. No so we're, oh, we're the other pension. Sorry. So we're 74% funded 74. as of the end of last year. They actually strike it. They only strike it once a year, officially. Yep. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't know the 2007 number. But in general, I think most pension funds have kind of... Well, I, it's been it's you know it's it's been a little more moderated to be honest with you. I mean, it depends on how much you're contributing, and there's a lot of factors that may go into it beyond just interest rates and you know and, and market returns. So. Right. We're slightly overfunded, but it just it's an artifact, a bit of an artifact of the accounting scheme by which the the, the CPP is assessed. Yeah. And you had a question right here. Yes, yeah, so, uh, sort of beyond North American limited partners. Could you speak a little bit about an idea, a mix of international LPs along? Um, the strategy is with you. Um, you know, is there a certain percentage that you find to be value add in terms of that, um, um, that, pos that position? Nobody can hear that, I'm sure. Sure. Um, so, uh, can so we take this last question? Are we good to take this last question? Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I think we've actually run out of time. I, I, I apologize, <laughs> but. Um, I, I mean, it was a good question. It was a good question. Do <laughs> you want to you want to just repeat the question one more time, sir? Okay, fine. We, we, we're done. All right. Okay. I'm gonna do a quick answer. You guys, uh, nice round of applause for you. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you. The 2019 Greenwich Economic Forum is brought to you by Bridgewater Associates. Meaningful work. Meaningful Relationships, Churchill Asset Management, Nuveen, a leading provider of senior and uni trench debt to middle market companies, Ropes and Gray, Bright Past, Brilliant Future, Aurora Capital, Inspiring Partnerships, and Gramercy Funds Management, We Are Emerging Markets, Special Considerations to Bank of America, Life's Better When We Are Connected, NOAA Private Wealth Management, a leading wealth and asset management service provider in China. Go Tai Jinan Futures, a leading brokerage firm for commodity futures and financial futures in China. China Industrial Securities, a comprehensive financial group providing full spectrum financial services in Hong Kong. And Titan Advisors, built like a hedge fund. Special thanks to the Financial Times and Greenwich Business Institute for hosting us. And thank you to all the sponsors who helped make this event possible. We'll be right back after these messages. Don't go away.